Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Claremont United Methodist Church this day. It is a joy to be with one another as we continue our journey through the Easter season. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements to share with you. Uh, first, we are very excited and grateful uh, to welcome back Barbara Duras. She will be leading us in uh, music and worship through the piano in the next month, and we are grateful to have her with us. Uh, this Tuesday evening at 7 in the Narthex will be our quarterly church council meeting. Um, so if you're interested in church council, please know that uh, it is always an open meeting and the invitation is open to all in the church. And lastly, I would just like to invite Maisie and Dean up to share a special announcement. Good morning, I'm Dean McVeigh. And I'm Macy Dawes. And we're members of the Claremont United Methodist Church Staff Parish Relations Committee and members of the Musician Hiring Committee. Today we have some exciting news to share with you regarding our musician's search. First, we want to let you know that you are all welcome at two o'clock this afternoon in our church. We will have an uh, applicant perform a couple of preludes a couple of hymns and a postlude here in the sanctuary as part of their application and audition process. So you're all welcome to come out today at 2 p.m. Also on May 19th, as part of the application and audition process, we will be hosting a candidate for the choir director position who will conduct the sanctuary choir during our delivery of the morning's anthem, May 19th. And in order to have the fullest choir possible and to put our best foot forward for our potential candidates, we invite you to consider joining our wonderful choir up here so we can show our candidates how committed we are to growing and enriching our beautiful sanctuary choir. Each week we are grateful for and hear your beautiful voices sing our hymns from the pews and would love to have you join us in the choir loft. If you are unable to read music, have never sung in a choir before, contemplated joining us, or have not sung in a choir for some time, fear not. We have a place for you. We rehearse on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. and at 8.45 on Sunday mornings just prior to worship service. The SBRC is 100% committed to rebuilding our wonderful music program, and we invite you to be part of the process. Uh, one footnote to that, our candidates are confidential because they are all currently employed, so if you happen to meet one of them, uh, please don't tell anyone. <laughs> Altos, tenors, sopranos, and basses, baritones, all voice parts are invited to join us this and every Thursday for uplifting and enjoyable choir rehearsals. We meet from 7.30 to 9 p.m. and hope to see you there. If you have questions, I or any other of our choir members will be happy to provide additional information after church. Or this afternoon at two o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Let us join together in our call to worship. You come amongst us to disrupt the ordinary. Help us live into all you reveal through ritual and community. Amen. You may be seated. We invite the children to come forward for children's time. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Good. All right, so today, after worship ends and after you get done with Sunday school, what happens at the church? Hint, you do this every Sunday when we're done with worship. What do people do here? Give out snacks. Yes, right on. We give out snacks. We eat and we have coffee. What are some of your favorite snacks we have here? Cookies. Yes, the sugar. Other favorite snacks? Lemonade. Lemonade. So why do you think we do this? Because, the, because church is long and people want to eat. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best not to take that personally. Um, I appreciate that you feel safe enough to be honest. Well, <laughs> well, in our Bible story today, Jesus is once again meeting with his disciples, and he wants to eat with them. He says, Let's spend time together and eat. And in the book of Luke, Jesus spends a lot of time eating with his closest friends, eating with strangers and new people. Because sometimes eating together helps us become very close. Do you like eating with friends and family together, having good food? Yes. So I remember a time during Thanksgiving, Olive and Shep, Pastor Katie and I came to your house with a youth group for their Thanksgiving, and there were a few moments that really stick out. So during, while everyone is eating, Shep had finished his meal, and he's doing these very uh, dangerous somersaults, and every time he flips, there's a very loud thud of his head hitting the ground. We were very concerned. I think your mom knew you were okay, but we were a little alarmed, and then later, on your mom's nice, beautiful white tablecloth, you spilled all the gravy all over it. Do you remember that? I do, because it, it was a fun time. Like We were all laughing. You didn't get in trouble, but we were all laughing because everybody spills stuff at some point. But we were having a meal together, and so sometimes when we eat and we're getting to know each other, those moments stick in our mind. And we were having a good time. We were all sharing fun stories. You were entertaining us, and we were getting to know each other on a deeper level. There's something about eating together when you're having goldfish and cookies and lemonade that we just get to be a little more ourselves, and we get to share what's going on in our week. You get to share about your teams, what's going on in school, and we as the church love to eat together, and it's often a joke that we love to eat, but it's so we do it because it's very meaningful to share a meal where sometimes strangers become friends and friends become like family the more we eat together. And that's why in the Bible, Jesus constantly was eating with those he was closest to. Because then you get to take time and spend time together and just share what's going on in your life. So to not make church any longer, we're gonna wrap it up here and I hope that next time you get to eat together, even if we make a mistake and we spill stuff, it's all good. We just get to share food together 
and we have good memories of getting to know each other. All right. Keep eating with your friends and family and keep sharing good food. All right, now let us pass the peace. So I'm gonna invite you to stand and say to the church, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Now let us share signs of peace to our neighbors. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus actually stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. In their panic and fright, they thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you disturbed? Why do such ideas cross your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, really. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as I do. After saying this, Jesus showed them the wounds. They were still incredulous for sheer joy and wonder. So Jesus said to them, do you have anything here to eat? After being given a piece of cooked fish, the Savior ate in their presence. Then Jesus said to them, remember the words I spoke when I was still with you. Everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. Then Jesus opened their minds to the understanding of the scriptures, saying, That is why the scriptures say that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. In the Messiah's name, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to all of this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
my peace I give on to you. Thank you, choir, for that blessing that you've given us today. Will you pray with me? Holy One, be with us. Guide us as we unpack your word and your offering of peace. May the word nurture our spirits as we work with you to do what we have been called to do. Amen. I would like to begin by sharing that as I prepared for today's preaching on the lectionary, I was really struck by the fact that we're back in the Gospel of Luke. We've been in the Gospel of John for a really long time, and the lectionary just decides, hey, let's jump all the way to Luke so we can get this revealing and retelling story. So as a good biblical scholar, I did my exegesis work and my biblical roadmap, which led me to the text before our lectionary today. And I hope by highlighting this story, The Road to Emmaus, that this retelling of this scene will help you get some context for Luke's theology and our scriptural passage today. I hope that you will gain greater meaning by hearing the story that is mirrored right before. The journey to Emmaus happened on the same day as the resurrection recount in the Gospel of Luke. It is the first Easter Sunday, three days after Jesus' death, and the women encounter angels and share their experience with the apostles that Jesus' body is no longer in the tomb. The two travelers are met on the road, and they're retelling this story. We meet Cleopas, who is named by history and is uh, retold in the biblical account, and a second traveler. This second traveler is cloaked in mystery and is a bit androgynous. Sharon Ringy dares to name this companion as a female. The wife of Cleopas, um, who is in the Gospel of John, uh, Mary. There are many Marys in the Bible. This Mary is Jesus' aunt. She was there at the crucifixion. She stood at the cross and saw her nephew crucified. Knowing how Luke minimizes the role of women, Sharon Ringy dares to give Mary an identity, a personhood, and a central role in this resurrection appearance. In this appearance, Mary and Cleopas are discussing all the things that have happened the last few days, and they don't recognize the man who has walked up alongside them. This is one of the themes that we've been hearing throughout this Easter revealing, that Jesus appears to them and they don't fully get it. They don't fully see Jesus in their midst. So they share the story. Their Messiah was killed at the hands of the state, the Jewish leaders of the day. Our chief priests and leaders delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. They are sharing their deep sorrow and disbelief. We were hoping that this was the one who would set us free. This was the prophet of God, the one promised by scripture. How could his story end this way? This morning, news came from women who were visiting the tomb that their teacher's physical body was no longer at the grave. Their recounting and hope stirs Jesus, and they still don't fully recognize him. They don't fully get all that was foretold in the scriptures. 
So Jesus goes into teaching mode. It's time for him to give his capstone lecture again, to tie together all the threads that are essential to their movement and their shared mission. Jesus unpacks scripture, the words of the prophets, the words of Moses and the Psalms, and he gives a theological outline of how all these promises of the ancestors do in fact point to Jesus. They point to Jesus's life, death, and yes, a resurrection. He shares all of this as he continues to walk with them, move to their destination, move to the home of Cleopas and Mary. Jesus continues to share scripture and he does some theological unpacking. You know, scripture's pretty hard to understand and we need to ask it really hard questions. I think our lectionary group does a really good job of doing this every week, but we should all be doing that deep unpacking and trying to get some theological depth and meaning as we ask really important questions. So after Jesus shares his unpacking, his theological understanding through conversations with Cleopas and Mary, they share a meal. Jesus goes and he breaks the bread. He drinks with them. Isn't this an echo of something he just did before his death? It is only then when Jesus sits at the table, eating with them, breaking that bread, giving them something to drink, that this ritual awakens something within them. This ritual helps them get it. Word and holy ritual open us up, help us recognize that Jesus expects holy encounters. The ark of scripture and all that was foretold to the ancestors just clicks. It makes sense. Their teacher has conquered death. Their teacher has conquered death to sit with them to eat with them, to be in the flesh again. This Messiah comes molding God's mission by spending time with them, by eating and talking and learning together. The mission is that simple. Spend time together. Spend time getting to know God experiencing God and eating together. Time and fellowship is only strengthened by holy ritual. That brings this couple to the great realization that they have so much more to do, that this larger mission, this ever-changing holy story of God needs each and every one of us to be a part of it. We must go to Jerusalem, they say. Tell those other disciples who are hiding away what has happened to us. They are compelled to share what has happened, the truth of scriptures, the truth of God's mission that continues in and through us. This is the catalyst for our passage today. I hope that in telling the story before that you can recognize that our initial appearance, the road to Emmaus, mirrors the appearance to the apostles. Mary and Cleopas, they enter the room with the greeting and proclamation. Remember, they get it. Christ has risen. They are sharing their overwhelming joy of how their teacher broke bread with them, sat amongst them, sat at their table and ate with them. But their overwhelming proclamation of Christ is risen is not met with overwhelming joy. 
The tradition likes to emphasize that there were 11 gathered, 11 male apostles. But I'm here to tell you that there were certainly some women in the room. <laughs> we're always in the room where it happens. Mary was there with Cleopas, because they came and they offered that message and that greeting. But I bet there were other disciples other women disciples, at least one or two in this room, Jesus appeared to this group of friends and said to them, peace be with you. There is no response of also with you. Instead, this blessing of peace is met with panic, fear, and disbelief. A ghost is here with us. Ooh, frightening. So Jesus offers his flesh, offering the vulnerability of his scars and wounds to his disciples. As someone who has deep and piercing scars on my body from doctors trying to repair disabled flesh, I imagine these wounds to be sensitive. Some of my scars, the ones on my foot and leg, are still sensitive today, even after decades of healing. I know that some of you can relate to this, that you have ridges of healed flesh that even healed still don't like to be touched. Maybe you hide them away or you cover them up. Some of us have emotional scars. Some of those are a little easier to hide away, but they show up on the surface too. We don't urge people to directly look at our scars. Many times, we hide them away, but our teacher is doing something very different than the rest of the world. Our disabled God is putting his broken flesh, his wounds on full display. Stare at them, look at them, examine my pain, touch, feel, God, these flesh wounds, these fresh wounds. The disciples are encouraged to see, to feel, to experience God. This act is humbling, it's vulnerable, and only in that stance of vulnerability can we reset everything we know? The disciples move from fear, wondering if a ghost is amongst them, to pure joy, to understanding, overwhelming joy and promise. Their Messiah is here in the flesh, alive with them this day. For Luke, it's all about promise fulfillment. Jesus is the anointed one of Israel. This is essential, that Jesus is in the flesh with his apostles. We need to know that Jesus' resurrection is not just a spiritual one. It's not just wonder and mysteriousness, but it is physical. We need to feel those scars. We need to examine the flesh. Our physical bodies are redeemed. That is a part of the whole creation, our bodies too. Luke emphasizes that Jesus has physical needs in this text. Jesus gets hungry. He's eaten with Mary and Cleopas. He also eats with the disciples. Remember that cooked fish? You can smell it. So. Jesus is consuming and digesting 
food. Jesus needs food. This is reflected in the text, and it kind of emphasizes what Gusto Gonzalez says, that Jesus has been eating his way through the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> Jesus has eaten with sinners, tax collectors, Pharisees, and this group of disciples just before he was arrested. And now the resurrected Christ is sharing a meal again before he leaves them, before he ascends to Abba, there is a meal. Community and family is formed around the table, a table of grace, a table of love and of acceptance set by God. Connections are made and hospitality and generosity fill and sustain us. Shared meals teach us a lot about one another, our history, our cultural experiences, our comforts, and our willingness to try new things and explore. Some of us, when we cook, we like to follow directions very strictly. Others of us pour in all the mixes and go with the flow. They go with the taste and the smell of the meal. That's me. <laughs> but the bad thing is, I can't always teach how I cook. You gotta experience it with me. So, some of my favorite meals I've learned from friends. I've learned to make green pozole because my family only made the red pozole. My mom likes to tell me. But I learned to make green pozole from my Cuban friend who spent a lot of time in San Diego as a missionary. So she learned from other Mexican families to make the green pozole. And so every time I make it, I think of her. I've sat uh, in churches where kimchi barrels are fermenting on the outside, getting ready for some delicious kimchi for weeks to come. I've smelled the spices of jerk chicken and the spices of Indian samosas. Mm, I know, take it in. God wants us to experience, taste and smell the goodness and the hope that we are promised. How many of you have had a bowl of soup, maybe chicken noodle that has just soothed your soul? and fed you for that day. Meals have a way of just giving us the care and the nurturing that we need. Meals together not only nourish our bodies, but also nourish our souls, reflect our hope, and share our culture. Many of us have experienced the culture of hospitality, of welcoming at the table. And that is what we are invited to continue to do, to invite people to this community, to invite people into these pews, to share God's table with them. So let's have more holy conversations Let's struggle with scripture and find new lenses to examine it. Let's laugh together and share memories. Let's share meals. Let's share our experiences and perspectives, our beliefs and our hopes. Let's share our fears. Let's share our sorrows. Let's not be afraid to hide away our scars. But let's examine, let's live into the promises of the larger mission that we're called to do, to break bread together, to talk, to learn, to care. There is great depth and hope in shared meals. We come to worship always centered on the word of God, 
on these scriptures. And that's what Jesus was trying to do, to unpack and share deep theological meaning with the disciples, to share a meal and to call them out to act. Because you know this mission, there must be so much joy within you, so much assurance that you just got to keep sharing it. You've realized that Jesus lived, died, and lives again in and through you. So we learn the words of God and we give sacred actions and rituals to enliven and to enrich us each and every time we meet together so that we can act together, so we can continue this mission together, so we can share some promises and theological hopes with the rest of the world. Because the table is big, the table is ready, and the risen Lord has asked us to be a part of this mission as we are the church. So let's continue to learn together. Let's continue to dig into scripture. Let's continue to experience the holy through prayer, through presence, through eating together and services that are just a little too long, according to some. <laughs> together, we'll laugh and have overwhelming joy. Together, We'll call for peace and change in this world. Together, we'll get to know people who were once strangers, call them neighbors and friends. Let's be renewed by tradition. Let's be renewed by hospitality. And let's spend some good time together. Amen. Well, as Jesus ate his way through the Gospel of Luke, I offer my willingness to join you in eating through the community of Claremont. If you ever want to share a meal, we are available. That joke was a lot funnier in my head, but sometimes you try. Um, but sincerely, please know like Katie and I are always available and love to share meals with you. Let us pray together. Easter God, we gather this day with our friends and church family to proclaim and be reminded that you are with us, that you are among us as you sit down to eat with your friends. May we sit with you and may we not rush to the next thing, but to embrace time and communion with you and one another to give each other our full presence, to sit, to listen, to be 100% available to you and to each other, trusting that in the sharing of bread and in the sharing of a drink, your presence manifests itself among us. God, many people in our church community those that we love and have journeyed alongside for years are asking their community for prayer. So God, with all of our hearts, we pray for Jack and for Randy, for healing and for comfort. We pray for Jeanette Combs and her family, for Kay Lewis and loved ones of Fern Joe, for friends and family of Dorothy. We pray for those in our community who are grieving and experiencing loss. We pray for the family and friends of Nan Self as they grieve her passing. We pray for Lottie that this week you would grant her grace and comfort. We pray for Bill and the Guilfrey family for healing, strength, 
and presence. We pray for Pearl and Curtis and Evelyn, for healing and comfort, energy and rest. We pray for our world. This week we join with Christians all over the world in praying for Belarus, Moldova, Russia, and Ukraine. And we continue to hold in deep prayer the people of Palestine and the people of Haiti. And God, we pray for our country that in the midst of an election year, God, there is a lot of fear and anxiety. That in the midst of all that our neighbors carry and that we ourselves carry, May our church be a refuge. That no matter what happens, that we will be a place where we always counter fear with peace. Exclusion with embrace. That we would counter hatred with love, greed with generosity, injustice with prophetic advocacy. God, may our church always seek to be a witness to your ways of radical, inclusive love. And may we never be afraid to be this bold witness of welcome and love that this world so desperately needs. God, as your people, as we pray as one, may the sounds of our voices together remind us that we are not alone. And so together we pray as you have taught us to pray. Saying, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen we invite the ushers to come forward to receive our gifts and tithes
Will you pray with me? Holy One, who's given us daily bread, we offer just a portion of your generosity and hospitality to your table. We hope that this offering is a part of expanding your mission and hope throughout the world. Amen. Our closing hymn and response is an Easter favorite. He lives. Thank you. 